Thanks everyone for having me. This is my third time here. I don't know where the time has gone, but the first time I came was about, about five years ago. I think it was at the beginning of your lifelong learning series. And I recognize lots of you now, because many of you are my patients, and some of you have uh, come to a few of the lectures before. So what I always try to do is make sure that I provide you with useful information to update you, because there are changes in research in the field Every year, there's lots of research, and of course, um, being, having a background in research myself, I like to be at the forefront of that, and I, I think it's great that um, people like you guys are interested in knowing what's going on in research. So I read it, I uh, digest it, and then I share it with you. So I'll just tell you guys a little bit about my background, um, because I haven't met all of you before. So I'm a PhD audiologist, which means I, I have my audiology degree. I'm a clinical audiologist, I work with patients, but I've also done research at the PhD level. So I've published a lot of um, articles and I've done a lot of research on auditory science and the brain. That's my, my um, focus area of research. But I also did research uh, when I was in university on infant hearing screening, because I think it's important not just to think about hearing as we get older, but identifying whether or not we can hear when we're born. So, there, so I've done some publications and research on that end of the spectrum as well. Okay, next, please. Oh, so the, the yeah, there we go. So just a little bit of um, background so you know that I can come to you and talk to you and provide information to you appropriately. Um, I did undergraduate research in Calgary. I did my master's in audiology, clinical audiology, at Dalhousie in Halifax, where I did some of my internships. I did an internship at, at Georgetown University Medical Clinic, and then I did my PhD in auditory neuroscience. So my um, area of my PhD was how the brain changes after hearing loss. Um, and looking at particularly the auditory cortex and how we can train it to keep it functioning properly. I have been a board member with a nonprofit agency, and this is a great agency that you should all know about, called the Deaf and Hear Alberta Association. So I've been on their board since 2008. They have a lot of wonderful resources for people who have hearing loss or who are deaf. So, for example, if you needed an, an amplified phone, you could go there, they could um, show you some different types, and they could provide one to you. Great alarm clocks. And they have great alarm clocks, too, yeah. Um, and then I own two clinics, two audiology clinics. So I used to work in a clinic when I was doing my PhD and I loved it. I loved working with patients and I told my husband, um, you know, this is something I really love, I, but I think I could do this better than, than how they do it at this clinic. And he said, go start your own. <laughs> so that's exactly what I did. And now not only do I have one clinic, but I have two clinics um, with some very, very talented staff and some of you have met them, and towards the end of the uh, presentation, I'll talk about how um, we have some exciting news. We're hoping to be able to come to Canmore once a month to provide services as well. So next, please. So my current focus, of course, I've done lots of research, I do lots of volunteering, but um, my current focus is looking at the most recent technologies available in the field to help people with hearing loss. So whether that's hearing aids or different types of assistive devices, such as FMs, for example. Um, and then, you know, my real passion is educating and sharing information with people. So doing things like this, I just love doing this. Uh, I, I laugh because um, I did a presentation like this to my children's school. There were 60 children there, and I've never been so nervous in my entire life. <laughs> because I usually talk to adults, and so they're very polite with the questions that they ask me, but children are not, so <laughs> it was challenging, but, but wonderful. I learned a lot from that experience, and um, I hope to do more of that as well. Um, next, please. So this is, these are my clinicians, myself. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a registered PhD audiologist. Um, Ilan and Elise are my other two clinicians who are registered uh, hearing instrument specialists in Alberta and I did some of their training myself and I, I chose uh, for both of them to join my team because they're both very, very talented uh, clinicians. Next. So here's the, the interesting um, part of the study is that new, or part of this talk, is that there's new research coming out all of the time. 
When I was doing my undergraduate studies at the University of Calgary, I studied psychology, one of the areas of study um, at that time in particular was aging. And a lot of people were looking at the world's population as aging. And so they started longitudinal studies, so studies over a long period of time. And what's interesting is that was in the 90s, and now that we're um, in 2017, we can look at the results of those studies, and those studies are 25 years old, so we can look at some large-scale longitudinal results. That's why we have so much information coming out about aging, about hearing loss, about dementia, for example. Um, the most recent statistics that we have seen in regards of how prevalent hearing loss is shows that about 18% of adults over age 18 have some hearing loss. And this is a North American longitudinal study. Um, but there was a Canadian aging longitudinal study, that's the CALS. And what was interesting about that study was that it showed almost half, so 47% of Canadians between ages 60 and 79 have at least a mild hearing loss in one ear. And that's just astounding to me. I was, I was taken aback, actually, myself, um, at how high this prevalence was. So it just reinforces the need to educate the general public that, um, you know, we should really be doing baseline tests at least by age 60 because half of us by then will have a little bit of hearing loss. And I will talk about why it's important to address that hearing loss if there is hearing loss. But here's the other thing that's astounding to me is that even though we find that many people with hearing loss in Canada and almost half between age 60 and 79 in Canada um, have hearing loss, about three quarters of them do nothing about it. And that part is really, I guess, disappointing to me. Because of my research background, I know that if we leave a hearing loss untreated, there are many detrimental effects on our brain, on our life, on our quality of interactions with our family and friends. So most people right now, we know they wait between seven to 10 years to do something about their hearing loss once they realize they have some hearing loss. But of course, a lot of them don't necessarily realize they have hearing loss either. Next. Um, and before we talk about hearing loss, I, I do want to set the stage, and I've kind of added this slide after talking to the kids uh, at the school. You know, a lot of you potentially might have hearing loss based on this group of individuals. However, we certainly still want to protect our ears. Okay, so just because we have hearing loss already, a little bit of hearing loss, doesn't mean we can't further damage our ears from loud noises. So very, very important to consider some things such as a hairdryer for women. If you use a hairdryer close to your ear every single day, you are wearing out the tiny little hair cells in your inner ear. So just get some little ear plugs. We, have, we give them out at our clinic. I should have brought some, but we give them out at our clinic. Just put them in your ears to protect your ears. So it doesn't matter what age we are, we still need to consider hearing protection as important prevention for hearing loss. Next, please. And Lynn, if you could just click down several times. So use the down arrow, one, two, three, four, five. Perfect. Um, here's a cross section of our ear. Just to remind everybody that sound is simply air pressure. Sound vibrates down our ear channel, sets our eardrum in motion, which in turn set the middle ear bones in motion and the fluid and hair cells in the ear in motion. Then there's an electrical impulse which is sent to the nerve, which then goes up to the brain. In most cases of hearing loss that we see from natural aging, the deficit is in this inner ear structure in the tiny little hair cells that lie along the bottom of this structure. It's not blue inside our ear, by the way. <laughs> it's just to highlight it for you. If you could press down, Lynn, please. So this is the most common type of hearing loss, and it's, it doesn't have a very accurate name. It's called sensory neural hearing loss. So some people used to refer to this, not so much anymore, but you know, physicians, older physicians used to refer to it as nerve damage hearing loss. It's not nerve damage. It's the um, sensory cells in the inner ear. It's much more common than conductive hearing loss. 
And there are different causes, primarily aging, but also noise exposure and certain diseases and ototoxic medications. Okay, so that's the hearing loss that we're talking about when we're talking about the most common type of hearing loss for people in this group, okay? Of course, there are other types of hearing loss. For example, um, if you ruptured your eardrum, if you had these bones um, doing strange things like growing a little bit too much, there's other types of hearing losses. But in many cases, those are um, temporary and can be addressed with surgery or medication, okay? Once we get to the hair cell type of hearing loss, that's permanent. So that just reiterates why it's so important to protect our ears from noise. And don't forget about noisy things such as um, yard work. Maybe some of you still do some yard work. Maybe some of you, you know, it's interesting. I meet all sorts of patients. Some of them go to car races. Some of them take their grandchildren to monster trucks. Like we don't think about noise because we can't see it. So just pop some earplugs in your, in your purse or your backpack, just have them in there. My husband is in Portland at a concert, I put some earplugs in his bag. Next, please. So here's a picture of those outer hair cells that are so delicate, okay? These three rows right here, those are called the outer hair cells. Those are the ones that are damaged first because they're on the outside. So they're much easier to be damaged than the fine inner hair cells. Here's a close-up of the outer hair cells. And here's what they look like after they've been damaged from aging or noise. Okay, here's what they look like in someone who would have a severe to profound hearing loss. Very, very little hair cells left to detect sounds. And then if you could just go back up one slide, Lynn. Thank you. It just turns out that the outer hair cells that are closest to the entrance of the structure are responsible for the high frequency sounds. So they get worn out first, just like the carpet by a door. If you open your door to your bedroom, you notice, you know, over many years, the carpet wears down there first. It's the same principle. Okay, so we almost always see a high frequency hearing loss when we're talking about sensory neural hearing loss or hearing loss due to aging or noise. Okay, just to clarify. So if you can go down two slides, Lynn. Thank you. So many of you have come in to see us to have your hearing tested. Um, this is what we do when we are testing your hearing. We're looking to see which frequencies of sounds you can hear. So think of a piano keyboard on the left hand side that represents the bass tones. Here's the middle frequencies. And up on the right hand side that represents the high frequency or treble tones. So we want to know which tones can you hear? How loud do those tones have to be? Okay, and that's exactly what we do. We present tones of different frequencies until you can't hear them anymore. Okay, so we want to see the threshold or the softest sounds you can hear at each frequency. <coughs> Next slide, Lynn. I think this one you have to press a couple. Yeah, there we go. And this is what we come up with, a graph. So think of those frequencies again low frequencies on the left up to increasingly higher frequencies on the right, and we plot the softest level of sound that you can hear. This x-axis is a decibel level. So if you can hear the sound softly, you'd be up near the top. As we have to make the sounds louder for you to hear them, you need loud, higher decibels to hear them, your results go down. So this is a Pretty typical hearing loss that I would see if someone came into my office and perhaps they were 70 years old. Okay, so we see the left hand side of the graph is above that darker black line. So it's within the normal range. You can hear sounds quite softly because you're up at the top. The sounds didn't have to be made a lot louder. As we move to the right hand half of the graph, we plotted you much lower. That means that we had to make the sounds much louder for you to detect them. Okay, and again, remember I said those hair cells that are closest to the entrance of our inner ear are responsible for the high frequencies. So that's why we see this kind of hearing loss very often with hearing loss that's related to natural aging. After about age 45 in men, we start to see the early signs of this. About age 50 in women, we start to see the early signs of this. Um, but that's just one part of the test. It tells us how you can hear different tones, 
We don't walk around the world listening to different beeps or tones. We need to listen and, and understand words. So we also do other tests, including a speech discrimination test. And that's a much more important test than how well you can detect the sounds. If you can detect soft sounds, but you can't understand them, that's not a very good result. Okay, but however, if we have to make the sounds quite loud for you, but you can understand them, that is something we can work with. Okay, that tells us that the listening part of your brain is still functioning. It's just those little hair cells that need a little bit of help. All right, so that's a very, very important test. Um, we go beyond this, I need to update this slide, and we also do a listening in noise test. Because we don't just listen in a quiet room. Okay, so when we test you, you're either in a quiet room, let's say when you come here for testing, we'll test you in a quiet room. If you come to one of our clinics, we have a sound reducing room, okay? But that's not the real world. So what we want, certainly we want to see, you know, how accurate we can get your test results. Yes, and that's why we test you in a quiet situation. But to be a realistic test, we want to test how well your brain can understand words in background noise as well. That's a listening in noise test. So there's been a lot of research, particularly in Australia. They have an excellent um, acoustic laboratory over there. They put together a very easy to do test um, that basically uh, requires you to repeat phrases while people are talking in the background. Isn't that a good one? It's like you're at a restaurant that's noisy or a coffee shop that's noisy. So I really like doing that test with my patients. It gives us a good idea of not just how well they can hear sounds, but how well they can understand sounds in the real world. Okay, next please. And what are some of the signs and symptoms for hearing loss? And a reason that might prompt you to come in for a test when we come to Canmore, or to send your family member or your spouse for a test when we come to Canmore. Um, these are some of the symptoms and I would say you know if you have one of these symptoms once well obviously that's not a problem but if it's a repeated issue then yes you should probably come in for a baseline test so asking people to repeat repeatedly or frequently difficulty with understanding what you hear difficulty in background noise or a crowd restaurant coffee shop starting to isolate yourself because you can't hear well enough to participate in activities. So, and we'll talk about why this is so important, but that's a really, really big one. So if you have a friend or family member who used to come to these types of events and they don't feel that comfortable coming anymore because they might misunderstand things or, um, you know, say the wrong thing, that's actually, that's a, a symptom of hearing loss. Turning the TV or radio up a lot louder than other people Difficulty on the telephone, because of course you don't have visual cues. And ringing in the ears. So I usually say, if you have two or more of these symptoms frequently, that's a good idea to have a test. However, we also know now from the research, if you're age 60 or over, you should have a baseline test also. Why not get an idea of where your hearing is at so we can follow it over time? And then if you're missing a few things, we can help you capture those sounds again so you don't lose them in the future. Next, please, Lynn. Um, I think it's important to understand why people feel like they can hear but not always understand. So it's because I explained those high frequencies are hard for you to detect as we get older. It's always those high frequencies we lose first. But what's important to understand is how speech works. The vowel energy is mostly on the left-hand side of the graph in the base frequencies. The consonant energy is mostly in the high frequency area. Consonants are what give our brain the perception that speech is nice and clear and easy to understand. So if you have some hearing loss, even if you had a hearing loss just like this, which would just be a mild hearing loss, it's quite common that you might feel like, yes, you can hear most things, but they're not clear and you don't really understand them. Okay, so that, you know, if you feel like you can hear but not understand, that's definitely a sign of hearing loss. The other reason why people sometimes feel like they can hear but not understand, especially if there's 
other things going on is simply because our brain changes as we age. Okay, our brain slows down. It doesn't follow things that are changing quickly as easily. So it's certainly harder to follow rapid speech, and you know everyone today speaks very quickly. Okay, so just as a function of aging, and when I say aging, I mean age 35, our brain changes. It can't do these functions as well as it used to. So we can't follow rapid speech, we have more difficulty listening in noise, and we have difficulty understanding accents because accents are simply a different rhythm of speech. Okay, so those are some of the reasons why sometimes it feels like you can hear but you can't understand. So if you or your family or your friends experiences that, that's a sign and we should definitely do a baseline test. Next. Here's what I really want to talk about um, in a little bit de of detail today is that there is a link between hearing loss and dementia. Remember I said that research has been going on in aging over the past 25 years. Well in the past 20 years we have found that older adults with hearing loss appear more likely to develop dementia. Why is this the case? I'm going to get into that in the, in the next few slides. Next, Lynn, please. One of the reasons we think this is the case is because the physical brain actually changes. If we don't have the proper input in the ears, nor do we have the proper input at the listening part of the brain. And research from 2014 shows the connections between the ear and the brain are important to stimulate the cells at the brain. And if those cells aren't stimulated for four and a half years or more, they slow down, they shut down, and they atrophy. That's research from John Hopkins a Medical Center. Next. So this was a study done by Dr. Lin at John Hopkins. Um, and he showed the physical changes of the gray matter of the brain. As I mentioned, if the hearing loss goes untreated for four and a half years in NeuroImage is the journal. Why is this the case? Again, probably because of lack of neural active activation. So not enough stimulation. Very similar to our muscles atrophying if we don't have the proper exercise and stimulation. Okay, so if you don't use it, you lose it. This is the proof. Okay, next. Um, what was interesting though in their study wasn't just that we saw the auditory areas um, deteriorate. What was really interesting about this, you know, we suspected that, right? If you're not getting um, auditory stimulation, it, it kind of is intuitive that you wouldn't be getting um, auditory stimulation at the brain, right? But what was surprising was that the people in their study also showed atrophy in a different area. It's called the superior temporal gyri area. And that area is important for memory, and cognitive skills. So we're not talking about hearing loss, hearing, understanding, listening, or anything. We're talking about cognitive skills. Okay, so that was a really important study in this area that explains, helps explain why people with hearing loss, and particularly untreated hearing loss in this case, have some changes at the brain. Okay, next. Another reason why we think there's a link between hearing loss and dementia comes, um, is described as something that we call cognitive load. This research, a lot of it has been done at the University of Toronto. And basically, Dr. K um, Pecora Fuller explains that if you use all of your energy for helping you hear, so you're straining and you're focusing, then you don't have as much energy left for your memory, or your vocabulary, and other executive functions at your brain. Okay, so if your brain is carrying that load to help you hear, then you don't have as much left over to help you do the other important work that the brain does. So patients who have hearing loss, are, they're working harder. I like to think of it as they're straining, and not just straining with their ears, but straining with their brains to understand what they hear. Next. And finally, and this one, I can't stress this one enough because I see this all of the time. 
I think the third and possibly most important reason why we see a link between hearing loss and dementia is because of social isolation. Okay, I'm sure, I'm sure each of you know at least one person who doesn't do the activities that they used to enjoy doing because of their hearing. I bet you can think of one person at least. Um, we know, and research has shown, that social isolation is a known risk factor for dementia and Alzheimer's. When people start withdrawing from their favorite activities, from their you know, um, social groups, they don't have that social stimulation. And that social stimulation is so important for healthy brain function. So I see this one all the time. When people come in to me, I do, we do a, like a case history. We ask people the types of activities that they like to do. We want to know what kind of lifestyle they have so we can make appropriate recommendations based on their lifestyle if they do have hearing loss. And I hear this all the time. They say, well, I used to do this. I used to do that. And I say, why don't you do that anymore? Well, I don't, I don't hear as well. I don't feel as confident doing those things. I might answer incorrectly. And, and that just, that really breaks my heart. And that's why I want to get people in to get tested sooner so we can get on top of those things, so they can keep doing the activities they love doing. Next. So, what can we do to offset these changes at the brain? Okay, it's not all bad news. Just because you have hearing loss doesn't mean you're going to get dementia by any means, okay? <laughs> However, there's enough research to encourage people to take this seriously, to go and get a baseline hearing test. Perhaps if there's a problem, to at least consider receiving treatment. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but start thinking about it, okay? Um, one of the things we can certainly do is provide treatment when necessary. If there is hearing loss that, you know, falls outside of the normal range, we can certainly use hearing aids. Hearing aids are improving literally every day. I go for training multiple times a year. I was just away a few months ago, and even I, when I listened to the new technology, I actually said, wow, this is, this is exciting, this is um, an improvement over what we had. So things are improving, things are changing. So there are lots of hearing aids to, designed to help get the sound from the ear to the brain. Okay? We do have to remember that you know, hearing loss is filtering what's getting up to your brain. So if you're walking around with hearing loss, it's almost like you have your fingers in your ears. You're walking around, you're not getting all of the information, all of the stimulation that you were getting before. And you may or may not realize all of the sounds that you're missing or all of the information that you're missing. But by providing you with hearing aids, if you need them, need them we can get those sounds back that are important for your brain. Um, we can also look at devices that go beyond hearing aids. And some of my um, Lovely patients have some of those here today. So Doug is wearing a really interesting um, pen. I'm going to just show you what it looks like. I brought one too. Okay, so sort of like a magic wand. Wherever you put this, it's like you have another ear. Okay, so if you were at a, a board meeting, for example, you could put this on the board table. Okay, and it would bring the sound from the different people to a device that you wear into your hearing aids. Okay, so those are assistive devices that work with hearing aids. So if people are having trouble with their hearing aids, sometimes we have to go beyond the hearing aids. What's the cost for those? There's lots of different options. Some of them can be as inexpensive as $300 for, you know, a, a mild one to do with a mild hearing loss. Some of them can go up to several thousand dollars depending on the severity of the hearing loss. Yeah. Pretty cheap when you think about the choice of dementia. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lynn said that's pretty inexpensive compared to getting dementia, but remember, just because you have hearing loss doesn't mean you're going to get dementia. I, I don't want to say that. But still, we want to get all the information we can from the ears to the brain. Next. So here's some really important information. I didn't have this information last time I was here. I know this. So this is a big study that was done in France. Um, 
It came out in uh, 2015. Again, in France, just like as in North America, they've been looking at longitudinal research on aging for about 25 years. They looked at almost 4,000 people. They had a group who had hearing loss with no hearing aids, who had normal hearing, and who had hearing loss with hearing aids. And what they found was interesting. The cognitive decline, as shown on a little test called the MMSE, the Mini Mental State Exam, which shows vocabulary, executive function, memory. So there was more cognitive decline. It was significantly worse in those people with hearing loss and no hearing aids than in either other group. Okay, so those people who had hearing loss and did nothing had more changes to their cognitive function. So this is a big study in my field that helps support the fact that hearing aids may have acted as a protective measure. Okay, so if you have hearing loss and you don't do anything about it, this study supports the fact that, you know, there's the potential for permanent detrimental effects. And on the other side of the coin, if you have hearing loss and you do do something about it, which many of you have, you're actually doing something positive for your brain health. Next. Um, it's really hard to see that, but so I'll just let you know. It says hearing aids, how do they work? What's important to know about hearing aids is they're an aid. I think they were very well um, described in their, in their name. They're an aid, okay? They're aiding you to get the sound from your ears up to your brain, but we have to remember we're limited by what's going on at the brain. So as the brain changes as we age, or if we have other issues, you know, the hearing aids can be only so much help. So sometimes we have to do some other things like assistive devices. Sometimes we might want to do some oral rehabilitation, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Next. There's all different styles and shapes of hearing aids. Lots of you are wearing them today. Um, the size, shape, and style does not dictate the cost. The cost is dictated by the circuit that's in the hearing aid. So, for example, if you go to Costco, I know that the circuits there are circuits that I provided probably four and a half years ago. Okay, so they might look the same on the outside, but the computer chip and circuit on the inside is, can be very, very different. So that's important. You need to go somewhere um, where they're going to get you the very best, very um, most recent technology, I think is really important. You know, would you want to go and invest in a computer that's four and a half years old? Not really. Okay, so that's, that's important. I think people get confused because hearing aids look the same on the outside, but that's only part of the picture. Next. Um, hearing aids are design designed to amplify speech. Next. So they're really designed to help you hear voices and conversations. And this one just shows that they are designed to pick up whatever's closest to you. Okay, so they're not designed necessarily to pick up like a situation like this where I'm far away from you. That's, what assist that's where assistive devices come in. Okay, next. I'm sorry, it's hard to see these. Um, but I'll just go briefly through some of the updates. So we have open ear technology where a lot of you have these hearing aids where they leave the ear canal quite open. The Lyric, so the implantable, non-surgically implantable uh, hearing aid is an option for some people. Rechargeable hearing aids, this is brand new. So we had a few manufacturers who had rechargeable hearing aids in the past. They weren't um, extremely reliable. I now feel comfortable that there are at least two manufacturers that make very reliable, rechargeable hearing aids. This is brand, brand new, and um, I say finally, <laughs> it's taken long, oh, long enough. Cross systems, if people have deafness on one ear, um, there are devices that can pick up sounds from that side of their world and send them to their better ear. So that's important to know. Bluetooth, a lot of hearing aids are Bluetooth compatible now, so you can stream information from a movie from your iPad or music from your cell phone. Water resistancy, um, many hearing aids are very water resistant. I had a patient dive into a swimming pool, came out, his hearing aids were still working absolutely 
perfectly. So they're designed for that. So it just goes to show that we have to really assess what's going on in your life and your lifestyle. If you might be the kind of person who does uh, water aerobics three times a week, perhaps we should talk about water resistancy. So it's important that we um, match the hearing device very well to the individual. And whatever is next, there are so many things coming down the pipe in technology with uh, wearables, right? Everyone has trackers, how many steps they've done, their heart rate monitors, etc. So I don't doubt that hearing aid technology is going to fit in with all of this in the next few years. So I'm watching that very, very closely. Next. So open ear cells, um, it's hard to see, but there's one hearing aid that's about as big as a blueberry now. It's tiny and it sits behind your ear with a little wire that goes into your ear. This is a blessing and a curse in my view because of course it's small and very nice and especially women with small heads and ears, you, you really can't see it. But guess what else is small? The battery is small. Those ones aren't rechargeable yet and so the batteries are very small. Because they're small, they drain quickly so they don't last as long. Right? So, you know, <laughs> there's pros and cons to everything. So we, we like to have that conversation. Um, if you need hearing aids, we want to think about what's more important to you. Here's a picture of the rechargeable devices. See how they have those little cases that they sit into and recharge? Sort of like a, a phone system. Again, I say finally, it's taken long enough. Um, next, what else can we do to keep that auditory portion of our brain properly stimulated by sound? This is important. What can you guys do as the general public to keep your <coughs> auditory system healthy? Next. Um, we're going to go next on this one and next again. So that was just going over some of the, um, again, the hearing aid options to, that are newly available. So if you have hearing loss, we want to get you the newest technology. Um, and then can you click about four times through this, please, Lynn? And next. Okay, so I'll go back to um, a little bit about hearing aids being an aid, and then we'll talk about what you guys can do in a second. So why don't hearing aids always fix the problem of hearing loss? And Lynn and I had a conversation before this lecture, and she said, can you talk to why some people might not be so successful with their hearing aids as compared to other people? So I know I have some lovely patients in the audience who have hearing aids from me who may or may not wear them consistently. So, yes, I can talk about that. So remember, hearing aids help improve the sound delivery from the ears to the brain, but the brain still needs to process it properly. Okay, and so after about age 30 or 35, our brain slows down. So again, even with hearing aids, it's still harder for our brain to discriminate sounds, follow rapid speech, listen in noise, and remember what we hear. Just because we put in hearing aids on doesn't change any of those things. Okay, so in a second we're going to talk about what you can do to work on those things. Next, please. These are some of the things you can do. If you have hearing aids, consistency is key. Okay, if you're going to run a marathon, you are not going to run it tomorrow without any training. Okay, if you have hearing loss and you have enough hearing loss that you need hearing aids, you've probably had that hearing loss for at least 7 to 10 years. That's what the research tells me. And I bet you've had it even longer because by the time you come in, that's usually seven to ten years after you notice the hearing loss. Most people don't notice the hearing loss for a few years before that. It's often their family or their friends who notice it. How do we know what we're not hearing unless someone points it out? Okay, so once we receive hearing aids, it's really important to wear them all the time, every day, from morning till night, all, for all of your waking hours. It can take up to 18 months of continuous use to fully adapt to the sounds that those particular hearing aids are providing to your ears and your brain. And when you change hearing aids, it can take up to 18 months again to fully adapt to those sounds. Okay? If people aren't wearing their hearing aids because they don't believe they're working, then here's a couple things to do to check. Have you been tested in the last two years? Perhaps your hearing has changed. Okay? Hearing aids are like glasses. If your eyes change, you're not going to wear the same glasses. But people forget that if our ears change, we 
We may need to update our hearing aids or we may need to simply adjust the settings. Okay, we can change the prescription on the hearing aids. Um, perhaps, you know, they've got to a point where their hearing is so challenged that, that they need an assistive device to help them in different situations. Okay, and that's nothing to be ashamed of, it's just how our auditory system changes. I have one gentleman who received his um, assistive device. He, he's on numerous boards in the city, and he said to me, I'm going to stop being an active participant on these boards. I don't feel like I can get the information correct, and I feel like I, I should step away from the board. I said, wait, let's try this. He tried this, and he is still on all of his boards. And this is about four years ago, when we had the first version of this, okay? So sometimes assistive devices can help. Um, but again, remember, ask them, are they wearing their hearing aids all the time? Have they worn them all the time for at least three months, every day, all day? And if their hearing aids, if they feel like they're not working, then they'll probably say no to that question. Have they worn them every day, all day for three months? Okay, but if they're, if they're having problems with their hearing aids, whether or not they got them from us, we can do an assessment, we can take a look at the hearing aids, we can do a little bit of education. Sometimes a little bit of education goes a long way. I have some people who might not be wearing a hearing aid simply because it's, it causes a bit of soreness behind the ear. And a simple change of a, a size of, of the wire, you know, can make all the difference. All right, so, I think if they have hearing aids and aren't wearing them, it's worth having them come back to see us. We are more than happy to get them back on track. Okay, next. Um, yeah, so oral rehabilitation. So the current treatment methods focus on, like I mentioned, other assistive devices, okay, and strategies in conjunction with hearing aids. So if someone's having trouble with their hearing aids, Yes, let's talk about assistive devices, so we will have that conversation with them, or let's talk about some things that they can do to wake up that auditory system. Okay, next. So again, I mentioned these far field devices. So I guess I just wanna uh, point out, like a gentleman asked, how much are they? Some of the smaller ones are much less expensive. They're also much less powerful, but they work. So I have a lady, she has trouble uh, hearing her kids in the back of her car when she's driving them to soccer, for example. You know, I think it was a $300 device, and now she can hear her kids in the back when she's driving, so she doesn't have to keep turning. Okay, but this work, you have to, uh, it requires hearing aids first that work together. Okay? Um, and I like to describe the assistive devices as an extra ear. Wherever we put this, whether it's in front of the TV, whether it's on someone's lapel if you're driving with them. It's like they're talking right into your ear. Okay, next. There's some other devices that, that can work really well if people are having trouble with their hearing aids or with their hearing in general. You know, there's some TV listening devices, there's special phones, there's shake awake alarm clocks, they're less than $25. I had one gentleman, he said he, he He's probably about 40. He said he travels for work all the time. He can't hear it all in one ear, so he sleeps very lightly because he's scared. He was scared he wouldn't hear his alarm clock. That was his, his biggest issue with his hearing. I said, well, let's get you a shake-awake alarm clock. I think it was $23, and it changed his life. Wow. Right? So, you know, we just have to assess the situation and make the proper recommendations for you. Next. What else can we do? Next, we can be active, and I don't have to preach to the choir here. You guys are very active. You're the most active group of people I've ever met. That's why I love coming back to you every couple of years. Um, active li listening offers sound exposure and communication practice. So having conversations with people back and forth is excellent for keeping the auditory system stimulated. Listening to music, uh, books on CD or on your iPad, watching television and movies, turning on closed captioning. This is a great one to help. If you already have hearing aids and you're having a little bit of trouble understanding what people say with them, turn on your closed captioning, okay? Watch some TV with it. If you miss the sounds with your ears, it trains your brain to get, well, you get the sound with your eyes, 
And that, in turn, trains your brain to recognize the sound the next time you hear it more quickly. Okay, so that's a great exercise. I give this exercise to people. I say use, um, practice one hour of TV listening a day with the closed captioning and your hearing aids on. And that's called oral rehabilitation. We're just getting that auditory system working. Um, using the speakerphone, if you're having trouble with your hearing on the phone, allows for what we call binaural input, information into both ears. Okay, so the brain likes to get information into both ears. Next. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe I didn't hear it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> utilizing two years over one, so at the beginning you appear to point out hearing loss is probably going to occur primarily in one ear, and one may be just fine. So, so good question. So the question, um, it, so your hearing loss is independent, you know, one ear to the other, but it usually does deteriorate at about the same rate. So with um, the statistics, okay, the statistics show those over age 60 in Canada, about half of them have hearing loss in at least one ear, okay, but it's gener generally both ears. But if you don't treat the one, that's all it is. If you don't treat the one ear, the research shows the connections to the other, to the auditory cortex linked to the other ear deteriorate more quickly. Thank you. Yes, lots of good information in there. Um, good questions. This is really interesting research. I didn't have this last time I was here either. Um, anything that stimulates the auditory system is great for our brain. And music is one of those things. And I know a lot of you guys um, go to different you know, concerts and things as part of this group or sh um, different offshoots of this group as well. There's some research done at uh, UC Davis. It showed that patients who had Alzheimer's disease, so they had significant difficulty with certain cognitive function, they still responded to music at their brain, okay? So it stimulated the motor region, it stimulated the cognitive areas. And they actually did some studies in New York, New York State. They did three one-hour music therapy sessions for Alzheimer patients for one year. This boosted their cognitive function by an average of 50% within less than a, a year. So, you know, anything that stimulates the auditory, auditory part of our brain is good, but music is wonderful. Okay, next. Um, going back to auditory training. So, the reason why I said turn on the closed captioning and watch the words um, that's one thing you can do, but the other thing you can do is listen very accurately to what you hear. Okay, so imagine that when someone is talking to you, and don't do this all the time, but you can, I actually give my patients exercises, I'll say do this for, you know, 20 minutes a day, a few times a week. When you're having a conversation with someone, imagine that those words, imagine each letter of each of those words. Try to capture that, like you have the closed captioning going across your forehead. Okay, so you're focusing, you're trying to recognize every single part of every single word. It takes a lot of energy and focus, but we know that that type of uh, training works because the brain can learn to recognize those tiny little small components of speech with training. Okay, research from the University of Washington showed this. Um, patients who listened to the S versus the SH sound we're able to actually discriminate the difference much more accurately with practice. So listening to sounds carefully is a wonderful free activity to do as well. Okay, so if you guys have questions that you know, um, you want me to put together a little rehabilitation exercises for you, you can just talk to me after I'll take down your name or you can send me an email and I'll, I'll tell you what I usually um, suggest to my patients, how often, how much of doing these things. Very easy to do. It takes energy, you'll see it's tiring. Next. How else can we keep the auditory system stimulated <laughs> properly? So some of, some of you here have tried this before. It's the Listening and Communication Enhancement Computerized Program. It's now been put um, online, so you can um, use your iPad or your home computer, do it at home. And basically what it does is presents sentences with varying degrees of background noise, for example, and you have to um, you play a little game. There's a few other tasks. There's memory tasks, vocabulary tasks. 
But it was externally validated by Northwestern University, and it shows up to a 30% improvement at discriminating words in noise. Okay, so it's, a, it's a not very expensive. Now that they've um, put it online, I think it's something like about $100 US. But there's at least um, 12 training tasks, training days. And the research shows that that training lasts for a number of years. Okay, so that's a fun, a fun thing to do um, as well. And that's available at neurotone.com. All right, I know the, one of the professors, Dr. Robert Sweeto, who developed that with some engineers. Next. And we'll do next. We already looked at that one. So what are some communication strategies for people with hearing loss? This is important too. If you have a friend who wears hearing aids but is still having trouble, okay, remember, not their fault, but their auditory system just doesn't pick up words as easily as it used to, particularly in noisy places or challenging listening environments. So what can we do to help them? We can reduce distractions and turn down the noise. Okay, so if we're in a really noisy place, step aside into a quiet area and have that conversation. Get their attention before talking to them. This is really important. We all have this bad habit with our spouses where we, we talk and walk away and they don't even know that we're talking to them usually, right? <laughs> so get their attention first. Yeah, you guys have experienced that one. Um, <laughs> face the person and get closer. They can read a lot of information from your face, but if you get physically closer, that just makes your voice louder and closer to their ear. Slow down your speech. This one's really interesting. There's research to show if we use chunks of information, take a pause and use another chunk, it's easier. We're not using so much of the cognitive load. Okay? Or you can also say things in a different way. Don't keep repeating the word in the same way. And with some of my patients who are, you know, have severe to profound hearing loss, sometimes I'll use written cues, like keywords, to help them. Next. Just quickly mention that tinnitus is related to hearing loss. Okay? So if the ears, hair, hair cells at the ear aren't picking up sounds and sending them up to the auditory cortex of the brain, the brain doesn't like that, so those cells spontaneously fire, and it's sensed as sound, and that's tinnitus. And it's very, very common in people who have hearing loss, so it is a sign or symptom of hearing loss. Um, we have good treatment success. If you have hearing loss and require hearing aids and wear them, um, in about 90% of cases, you won't notice that tinnitus as much because your brain will focus on the external sounds in the real world instead of the internal ones being produced at your brain. Next. There's a relationship between hearing loss and diabetes. Hearing loss is twice as common in patients with diabetes. This is new research too. Um, hearing depends on the small blood vessels and nerves in the inner ear. So if, those, if the blood glucose is changed, this can damage those vessels and nerves. So this is um, important. Hearing tests are often overlooked in routine diabetic care, but I'm going and doing lectures to a lot of physicians and they're very interested in this. <coughs> Next. Hearing loss and risk of falls. Same thing, lots of research coming out in this area. Um, untreated hearing loss is a risk factor for falls. They did studies that showed a person who was wearing their hearing aids with them turned on compared to turned off had less difficulty with falls. So again, this is really inf good information for um, physicians. If you guys have physicians who you think are open to this kind of information, please let me know. I have some great handouts that I've put together that I can share with them. Next. And it's really important, can you uh, press down about three times, Erlen, to get the best care you can. Oh, and go up one more. There we go. Um, hearing loss treatment is a process, like physiotherapy. Okay, it's not like, um, not like getting glasses, it's quite different. You know, most people who come to us who have hearing loss have had it for a long time. So their brain has had some changes. So we have to reintroduce those sounds gradually and do it in the best way we can. So you're going to have better success with a clinic that has excellent experience and background. So ask your friends for referrals, ask your uh, physician for referrals of places where they feel like they had really good care with their hearing. Next. Hearing aids are generally between two and $3,000 a piece. They're computers. 
That's why they're so expensive. So remember I said the style doesn't dictate the cost, the circuit inside does. Um, those FM systems, they've actually come down in price. The smallest one I think is $300 now, up to several thousand dollars. Telephones, around $150. Um, the government has different programs, okay? So we can help you with all of that. Next. Government, workers' compensation, Department of Veterans Affairs, there's a foundation for low-income Albertans, and some private insurance companies help if you need assistive devices or hearing aids. Next. So, the take-home message is, if you have concerns about you or your loved one's hearing, early treatment is more effective for keeping up your ability to understand what you hear, okay? And for brain health. That's shown time and time again in the research. So please get tested. Um, yeah, I'll mention one thing about that in a second. Hearing aids are in, definitely an important piece of the puzzle, but they are only one piece of the puzzle. We have to remember the brain changes as we age, and that's why devices can come in handy and help with this. Next, it's important, very important, for older adults to keep our listening skills active, so stay involved. Listen to music, particularly. Um, use closed captioning. Look at the words with your eyes. Use the speakerphone if you're having a little trouble with the phone. Next. And this is what I wanted to mention is that, um, so I opened a second clinic um, a year and a half ago. It's on the western side of the city, so it might be a little bit more convenient for some of uh, the people coming from Canmore. But we're hoping to come to Canmore once a month to do hearing evaluations to provide help with your hearing aids if you already have them. We can do some minor repairs. We can do some adjustments with our computer. It's all computerized now. So we just bring our equipment here um, and help you with that. So if you have ideas of where best we could do that to meet your needs, for example, Pat mentioned St. Michael's, I think, so I'll get in touch with them. Um, you know, other places that you think might be willing to host us, then please do let me know. Um, I have cards up at the front with my email address. I have handouts about diabetes and risks and dementia and brochures and all sorts of, of things. Um, I'm going to wrap up my talk. I'm going to open the floor to questions. Yes, in the purple. Autotoxic medications. Autotoxic medications are often cancer treating medications and they're called ototoxic because they attack the otology so the ear mm -hmm. yes but they're often generally cancer medications different types of cancer medications like cisplatin not no not not generally no no prednisone did okay so um that's not one of the ones that that would be considered no. Nope. Yeah. Yes. The cost of a baseline test. So we're going to come and do baseline tests here, complimentary. So there's no uh, fee to to have the baseline test. Yeah. If you can't wait, you can come into our clinic. Um, and anyone who attended this presentation, I have cards. I'll give you for to offer you a complimentary uh, evaluation in Calgary at our, either one of our clinics. Anyone who's anyone who's come here. Yeah. Lynn. I just wanted to tell a personal story. Uh, when, uh, you know, it's really hard, I think, as we age, we lose a lot of things. And so mm -hmm. losing hearing, I've, had, I've lost mine before the age of nine on one side. Uh, and, but losing hearing as we get older, we get really touchy about it, you know, because one more thing we're going to lose. Uh, however, we had gone and had some tests done from a standard you know, come and have your hearing test, etc. cetera, done. And mm -hmm. uh, went into Calgary to have it done. That was before we met Carrie. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman got us our, I think, a, a $35,000, $4,000 a hearing aid. Uh, and we're fitting them. And he said, I sure hope that these answer your needs. And I went, you hope? <laughs> you know, uh, and so I said, like, whoa here. That's my first clue that maybe he doesn't really know what parts of your hearing that Doug's not hearing. Mm -hmm. We were really blessed that we went to the association on the board. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was that 
Is that the right? deaf and hear Alberta Yes, and Association. the young man that is running that Carrie changed his life. And so he shared his life story with us about what you did for him in hearing. Mm -hmm. And the hearing aids we had were going to be a waste of money to Doug, and we started going to Carrie. Mm -hmm. And even though we, we continue, because we continue to lose our hearing, mm -hmm. she's one of the best things that ever happened. The other piece that happens is she's curt. Mm -hmm. You know, like, if I've got a hearing loss and I buy something that's five years old, guess what? I'm not going to wear them. I'm going to give up. You know, and we're seeing how important it is. So just from a personal perspective, and then, of course, we found out she was born in the Bow Valley, so <laughs> You know, you can't get a better combination than that. But I really encourage you. You know, we made our own appointment to go and see her because this, this young man said, you know, he was wearing the amplifier. Mm -hmm. which I'm going to have to go to. I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. He was married wearing the amplifier. Yeah. He talked about what he went through as a youngster with some congenital hearing loss that was just terrible. Mm -hmm. And he gave us the ball. Because Doug can't hear the, the our alarm clock. You can set it on his nose and he couldn't hear it. But I'll tell you, if the alarm clock is either shakes the bed, right? Or makes a sound that meets his needs. And yeah. it's just absolutely amazing. So mm -hmm. please, if you know, I look at aging, I think it's uh, a challenge anyway, but wow. <laughs> I think there's another question. Yes, there's a few. And if we don't get your questions now, I'm going to stick around. I'm in no rush, okay? So you can come up and, and I will answer more questions. I think Pat wants to wrap up um, the formal part of the presentation. So one last question, the lady in purple right there. Yeah. The, yes. Yeah. Um, for somebody who's had maybe um, a febrile uh, situation as a child and has lost hearing, mm -hmm. um, Can you or, describe your... Well, I mean, again, he goes to board meetings. And uh, when you're talking to him, you know, he'll yeah. turn his head. So it, it's typically one year. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll assess everything, whether it was from childhood or, or adulthood. But you recommend what might work for him? Absolutely. What oh, yes, work? absolutely. So not only do we test... That's a really good question. Not only do we test you, we can provide all of these different types of treatments. Yes, all of the different assistive devices and hearing aids, etc., or rehabilitation recommendations. Yes. Good question. Thank you.